Okay, that's our cue that we're going to start today's session. Welcome to the IDRPP's Project Scope. This is our last session of 2023. I can't believe that next year is just right around the corner. So thank you for joining us today. Um, take a minute and put your name and contact information into the chat. If you feel comfortable and you're willing, please turn on your cameras. It's a great way to just know who's on the call and um, just gives us that personal connection, even though we're over Zoom. Um, we are recording today's session. They are stored on our Canvas page as well as our YouTube channel. We use that for educational and quality improvement purposes. And you are always welcome and free to go back and review any of our past sessions and share those recordings with um, people that are, were not able to join our call today. Um, here is just a way to rename your profile. Again, trying to create that personal connection over a virtual world. So knowing who's on the call, um, who, who we are and where we work for is always a helpful way to do that. Echoes are an interactive community. So uh, if you have any questions, you can drop them into chat. Kurt helps manage it, the chat for us and he will answer, ask those questions or you can always just raise your hand and uh, we'll give you a call on that. Uh, as we're sharing any sensitive topics, just remember to protect the individual privacy. So don't avoid using their first, middle, or last name. De-identify any of the examples. And if you're unsure, you are always welcome to reach out to a hub member. They have an asterisk, or they will now have an asterisk in front of their name um, so that they're easier to locate in chat. Um, key components of an echo session is we will always have a didactic speaker um, and a case presentation and feedback. Today we are not going to be doing a case presentation and feedback, um, but we are lucky enough to have two amazing presenters um, for our session today. ECHO is really an interactive community, so case narratives or case discussions are a great way to get information from your colleagues, other members of the call. So if you're interested in doing a case narrative, um, a case discussion, or just getting some resources for a, a difficult or even an easy case that you're working on, um, please consider to reach out to us at Project Scope at usu.edu. Um, we send out a credit or a certificate for, of attendance after you fill out our survey. So we'll be dropping the survey link th throughout today's session. Um, and after those are completed is how we send out those certificate of attendance. Canvas is where we store all of our information. Um, so if you want access to our Canvas page, please reach out to us at projectscope at usu.edu. Um, and then just some exciting news that is that will be happening in our 2024 session is we are going to be starting a Time to Act Echo Substance Abuse Across the Lifespan um, and shifting our focus from just the supporting children of the opioid epidemic to how substance abuse impacts the whole family unit. So it will be held on the second Wednesday of every month at 12 to 1.30. And if you wanna just scan that QR code or go to our website, you can register for our 2024 um, series on that. So um, I am thrilled today to have uh, Athena Parker and Cindy Jones being our presenters today. I'm gonna stop sharing and turn the time over to Athena that she's gonna be talking to us about the medical home portal. All right, hi everyone. Um, I'm just gonna get set up here in presenter mode. All right, that should be showing for everybody now. So I'm here to talk a little bit today about the medical home 
portal and I've seen a lot of names come up in the chat that I recognize. So I'm guessing a lot of people are maybe already familiar with this tool. Maybe they'll learn something new that it can do today that can help um, in your day-to-day -day work. Um, or if you're unfamiliar with the tool, hopefully you'll be able to learn a little bit more about it today and how it could be um, a really great resource and tool for your work and care uh, for children and youth with special health care needs. So um, what is the Medical Home Portal? It, it's essentially a one-stop shop resource for all those who care for children and youth with special health care needs. And um, we like to really emphasize that as for all those who care for children and youth with special health care needs from clinical team members to educators to parents to caregivers. It's, it's a resource for for everyone involved in the life of a child or youth with a special health care need. And how we define special health care need is also pretty broad. We um, we try to include a lot of um, medical uh, special health care needs, but also mental and behavioral um, health care needs as well. So in a lot of ways, you may, um, you know, a lot of children and youth are affected by a lot of these things. And so it's it's a pretty broad population. Um, what we provide is, first of all, quality uh, information. So a lot of our, all the clinical information on our site is written by experts in the field. It's peer reviewed like you would see for a medical journal. Um, and then all of our information uh, for families on the site is written and or reviewed by those with lived experience. So parents who have experience with these conditions uh, coming from that family, family voice, family perspective. And then the other main piece of what the website tries to do is connect people with local service providers. And I'll show you a little bit about how that works on the site, but you can go ahead and use that QR code to um, connect with the site right now. I'm gonna do a live walkthrough demo of the site and it, I think it helps to get some hands-on experience with it. So you can go ahead and connect to the site either by typing in that web address, scanning the QR code and looking at it on your phone. The mobile navigation is um, fairly similar to the website, but I'll be showing you the website view. So this is what our main landing page for the website looks like. And as you can see right now, it's gonna default to what's considered our nationwide site. But in um, Utah, we're really lucky in that we've partnered with the Utah Department of Health to create a Utah-specific medical home portal page. So I'm gonna pop out to that now to show you how that works. So here is the live website. And um, as, as you can see here, I can, I can select my home. We partner with a few other states as well, but I can select Utah as my home state. It's gonna change the um, navigation up here to be utah.medicalhomeportal.org. And I would, you can bookmark this and set it as your, as your favorite. And that way, when you come to the website, you're always gonna get the, um, the most, uh, the best experience for for a Utah user because it's going to connect you with the, all the local service providers in Utah and also if there's any um, been any custom information added to the site for some of these areas you're going to see that Utah specific information. So now I'm just going to walk through kind of the main sections of the website. Again, feel free to like jump into the chat here. I'll try to keep an eye on it or raise use the raise hand icon, however you want to best interact. Um, I, I'm happy to answer questions as I go, but I'll try to leave um, quite a time at the end too for some nuts and bolts if you have questions about navigating the site. So first of all, we have this, the parents and families section. So again, here you can see we've got um, kind of two main headings under parents and families, so caring for your child and family, and then learning about diagnoses and conditions. So in that first section, there's a lot of information in here about things, all things to know related to um, trying to raise a child or youth with special health care needs and a lot of information about caring for your yourself, caring for your family, caring for other siblings, how to um, in uh, how to move through transitions of life with your child as well from early education to uh, 
to public school and then maybe to jobs and on to college as as youth and children transition into later in life. So again, there's a lot of really valuable tools and information in, in this section of the website. I'll just kind of walk through a, a few of um, the sections. So you can see here like Taking care of yourself and your family is kind of one of our main sections. And within here, we have all kinds of information about caring for yourself, caring for other children, fathers of children with special health care needs, um, respite care. Again, really a lot of great information and um, topics that could be valuable for those that you work with. Um, sometimes... Uh, uh, because there is so much information on our site, sometimes the content can be like a little bit overwhelming to people. So I always try to advise people that the best way to, to navigate the site, unless you know where something is specifically, or you're just browsing topics, is to actually come to this search bar at the top. So let's say I'm looking for information, for example, on early intervention. I type it up here in the search. And then what I'm gonna get back is, is all the search results first, but I can actually look at this by specifically about uh, split it between information for family and for, for, for professionals. So if I'm like, oh yeah, I'm looking for early intervention information, but specifically for families, I can sort here just to look at the four families info and you can see I've got all these great pages, um, you know, specific information about the Part C program, how to transition from early intervention to preschool, um, some general information about early childhood services, et cetera, et cetera. So that's like, just to give you an idea kind of of some of the, the breadth of content, that's just our, that's just related to early intervention on the site. So lots of really great information. And then that second part under parents and families is all about learning about diagnoses and conditions. And here's just a list. And these are all kind of frequently asked questions pages on specific diagnoses and conditions. And you can see we have quite a list here. I wanna say it's around 80 conditions right at the moment that have a frequently asked questions page. And again, these are ones that were, had input from people with lived experience. So if somebody has a new diagnosis, for example, of um, uh, uh, let's see, let's do PKU. They could look at this frequently asked questions page and, and can see, you know, some answers again by parents who have this lived experience or things that they may need to know of. These are great reference pages for um, people, especially with new diagnoses. Another really great thing about our site is that we're powered by Google Translate. So if you have a family that you work with that speaks uh, primarily a different language, you can come up here and say, oh, gosh, it would be so great if I had this information in Afrikaans, for example, and hit Afrikaans, it's gonna immediately translate the page for you. Um, and, and this could be a really great resource uh, to help families, like I said, especially with new diagnoses to get some really good high quality information on the condition. Let me put the site back in English. <laughs> Here we go. Um, so those are, the, again, the two main sections under the parents and families. We've got this, the whole caring for your child and your family and then learning about diagnoses and conditions. So the second main section on the site is written again more for in mind of uh, Parent, uh, professionals and physicians, but anyone on the site, obviously welcome to use the information there. Under this uh, heading, we have three main areas, providing a medical home, diagnoses and conditions, and newborn screening. And I'm going to work backwards on these just um, because some of them are a little bit uh, similar. So if we look at newborn screening, again, this is going to be similar to that list of frequently asked questions pages that we saw in the for parents and families, but this is specific to newborn screening. So they they give all the guidelines and information. So let's look, we'll just look at um, an example here about what to do if a positive screen is um, received. So it, it goes through what this screening is, what to do if there's an abnormal finding, um, who to contact. And then this is the piece that we uh, love so much about the tools, we connect people to resources. 
at the bottom. And then here specifically, um, at uh, we have these charts, little charts at the bottom of all of our newborn screening ones where you can actually connect people directly to services. So if you um, know this family is gonna need, gonna need to talk to medical genetics, you can see we have seven listings for the state of Utah. You can click on that seven. It's gonna take you to a um, map we can zoom in to see what the services are and um, where, where this person might need to go for further follow-up. Um, so that's a little bit about how the services piece runs and I'll get into that a little bit more later. So that's an example of a newborn screening page. Again, we have over 40 um, newborn screening conditions on the site. Then um, for diagnoses and conditions, again, this is a list, a pretty comprehensive list of different diagnoses and conditions that um, one may encounter in a practice or in a school setting. And in some cases, they're pretty rare conditions. So something that uh, somebody working in a small pediatric practice might not encounter very frequently and, and may need a little bit more information on. So if we look, we'll look at Angelman syndrome as our example here. So again, this is written a little bit, is more written with a clinical focus in mind, but also really great information for parents with a new diagnosis as well about what they could come to expect in terms of treatment and management for the, for the disease over, um, over time. So uh, here's an overview of it. It gives coding uh, examples for how to code in clinic, a little bit about prevalence, um, and then walks through really specific information around clinical assessment, treatment and management. Here, I'll just kind of scroll through the sidebars. These are quite lengthy. We call them our diagnosis modules. And um, again, at the end, we try to connect people with resources as much as possible. So I'm gonna scroll down. Sorry, it's gonna be a little bit hard to read. I just want you to kind of get an idea for what's contained in each of these diagnosis modules types of testing they might need and at what intervals testing should be done. And then again, here we try to, as much as possible, to connect people with local service providers. So here's a great example of, you know, they may need to connect with speech and language therapy. And you can see that in the Utah directory, we have 65 listings for speech and language therapy. So you could go to this map, scroll in if you're working from a family out in, um, in the price area, for example, you could see here's a here's a uh, an option of somebody you might want to send them to, or down here who we have in St. George, we've got a speech therapist, a couple of speech therapy op options. So the idea is not only to provide people with really high quality information, but also to, again to connect them to those local resources, and then. Um, at the bottom of each uh, module, we also have resources for uh, clinicians. And then again, more resources for families. They might wanna connect with some of these other um, national sites or other pages. Um, we try to highlight other pages on the portal that might be helpful to them. So in this case, they've highlighted guardianship and estate planning, financing your child's health care, that kind of thing. As much as possible, we try to cross-reference pages for people since the site is so content dense. Those are just some, and, the, and again, the table of, of um, providers at the end of, of here as well. And I didn't mention, uh, I mentioned before that the site is, um, uh, you know, it's written and reviewed kind of like a medical journal. You can always find information about who the current authors are at the bottom of each of these pages, as well as a full bibliography for all the clinical content as well. Um, back to our, uh, the last section within the, the physicians and professionals section is this providing a medical. So this is information more around things that might cross conditions. So some of the examples, this is probably one of my favorite sections in here is common issues for children and youth with special health care needs. So something like um, drooling tends to uh, be seen in 
in not just one condition, but across conditions. So here's information about how to address things like drooling. Um, there's also information in here around topics like toileting and sleep, um, things that you would see across conditions. There's information in here around coding and billing that could be helpful in um, medical practices. There's also information around uh, feeding and nutrition, education in schools, um, just kind of giving a, a brief overview sometimes how, how you know 504s work is less familiar to people in a clinical setting. So lots of really great information here. Um, and then some screening and prevention tools, lots of different screening and prevention tools um, around you know autism, obesity, CMV, dental, all kinds of screening tools are available there if needed in your settings that you work in. And, and that kind of wraps up uh, those two main sections. Now the last, uh, this third part is the service directory, which I've kind of already touched on. You can see how we've integrated that into the content too, but you can also just come and look for services directly as well. So if I click on the Utah services directory, it's gonna give me this um, landing page where I can kind of search for a lot of different things uh, um, in different ways. For I can search by search term, search category, and then location as well. So if I go back to that earlier example of early intervention for a good example, I can do just a search and it's gonna give me that same kind of map result that I looked at earlier. In this case, let's say I'm I'm looking in the, we'll go up to see what's the Farmington one. So this is gonna lead me to a listing about Davis early intervention. And I can look uh, at the listing more specifically to get all the contact info I need. It's gonna have a short description of some of the services that are provided. If I wanna look at eligibility, I can look at that. And we do, in Utah, we partner with 211 for a lot of the information that's on this website um, for the service providers. And you can see, you know, when it was last updated, uh, we try to keep everything on the site uh, updated within two years. So nothing is older than two years. And, um, but as always, we love it when people provide us with information as well. That's one of our best ways of getting information. So if you, are using the site on a regular basis and you ever see like, oh, I actually know that they've moved locations. You can see these buttons. We've got suggest and edit button. You can come in and leave a little note about like, they've moved. <laughs> here's the new address or here's the new phone number. Or if you see your own agency, even we love it when people submit things too. We also have, um, if you don't see the agency you're looking for, we have an op option to suggest a new provider. And this is a very similar form to the other one where you can suggest new services you think should be on the website. So I, I showed you a term search. I'll show you a quick service category search for, so sometimes um, you may have kind of a general idea of what you're looking for, but maybe you wanna know more specifically what could be there. So if I'm just gonna search education, for example, it's gonna give me a list of all kinds of different categories that I could potentially search that kind of are associated with education. So here's some good options we've got, for example, like adult education options, alternative education, educational advocacy, um, and that might help you kind of narrow down what you're looking for too. So in this case, you could say um, like, oh, I really actually want like, yeah, vocational education. That's uh, maybe what I'm looking for. And you could get an idea that way. And again, see all the results here and get, hopefully get some good service or uh, service resources listed here. Um, we also do have an alphabetized list of all those service categories as well listed down below if you're just browsing for ideas. And then the final final piece on the website is just a play a landing page for the states that we do partner with to kind of highlight some of the work that they've been doing in their states. So I'll show you quickly here. Um, again, these are the four states that we currently partner with. 
to provide a more customized experience on the site. And then for Utah, we highlight some of the work specifically around the children, Utah Children's Care Coordination Network, which if you haven't heard of, I'm also the facilitator for that. And I can tell you a little bit about that. Um, some transition to adult <laughs> healthcare information and then within the university, the pediatric writing elective and the, the writing and development groups. So that is the nut, the nuts and bolts of the site. <laughs> I'm gonna open up for questions for just a minute. And then um, I'm happy to show you one last uh, little feature on the site, but that's kind of the main navigation. Again, feel free to unmute yourself and just ask, or um, you can raise your hand or put something in the chat. We obviously have a really quiet group, Athena. <laughs> Nobody's asking any questions. That's great. I see. I just see if something came up in the chat. Somebody's got switched to another meeting. That's all right. <laughs> I get it. Okay. So I'll, I that's okay. Maybe you need some time to think on it. Um, so while you're thinking, I'll just show you kind of one last little piece about. Um, the what you could do with the site, especially um, maybe if you have a role in specifically working with families. So you could you've maybe seen that there's this sign in button at the top. Um, we uh, we do have you have the ability to sign into the site, create an account. All it takes is a email address and um, and uh, what it allows you to do then is save customized lists of, of service providers. So I'll show you an example of what that looks like. Um, you're going to see a screen flash here that you won't normally see. It's just because I have admin access, so sorry about that. I usually set it up to use another account, but I did not this morning. So this is what it will look like when you sign in. You'll see your name at the top, and then it'll say you've got the, the ability to like change your password, and then it has this thing called My Lists, and you're like, might be like, well, what's My List? So what My List allows you to do, again, is use that Utah a uh, service provider directory to build your own custom list. So let's say you frequently need a list of like free clinics in Utah or something like that. Something that like you'd share on a regular basis that maybe normally you would you'd keep like a Word document of or maybe an Excel file. And those lists are always like, they're always seems like they're changing. And as soon as they're shared, they're outdated. And then it's like, what version do you have? I don't know. What version do you have? Um, so this is a place that you can use the directory that's already there to build these lists, but then they also update in real time. So I have a lot of custom lists on my on mine. These are ones I've all built. Um, so I'll just show you uh, an example of one here as an option. So this is a, let's see, I know I had a free clinics one on here. So yeah, free and free and sliding scale clinics in Utah. So this is an example of one that um, maybe you would need to share with people on a regular basis. And so I've created this list of clinics and they're all um, listed here. And then what is really cool about this is I can get a shareable URL. So I, instead of printing and sending this list, I can get a, a shareable URL that I can, actually I'll stick it in the chat. You guys can see how it works. Um, so now anybody, whether or not you have access to the account, you can, you could, you can view this list, you can print it, um, you can add some notes and descriptors to this list. You could copy the list to your own uh, account and then modify it if you're like, oh, I, I like this list, but you know, I typically only refer people to like Fourth Street or Malia or something like that. And you could shorten it or or whatever you want. And then again, uh, here it's really great because if, for example, the address changed on Fourth Street Clinic, we change it in our database, the list automatically updates. So you don't have to keep track of um, 
you know, when the list was last published or what the most current version is. Um, and I'll just give you a few other examples of some lists, maybe just to start kind of thinking about how you could use this list feature. Like um, here's another example. This is like med ped physicians. This is around a transition project. So these are clinics that see children, um, you know, as they're kind of moving into those adult years uh, from pediatric practices into adult age. And it, uh, I can expand these listings here and see um, some specifics about, it's usually names the providers specifically that are like seeing uh, these types of patients. So again, just some, some more options there about how to use that list feature. It's open to anyone to use. Um, so what questions can I answer about this? Oh, Athena, there's one in the in the chat from Carissa. She says, yeah. looks like the person receiving the URL would need to have an account to access the list. Is that correct? No, they don't actually. So you is you can share the URL and somebody sh should be able to view it without having to sign in or have an account on the medical home portal. Okay. When I clicked that link that you just put in your in the chat, it actually took me to the portal page, but it, it wanted me to, to either create an account or it might it might register. still help you create an account, but you should still be able to see it without um without uh Athena, having an account. Yeah. Athena, this is Amy. I also just clicked the link, but if you copy the whole link, it takes you to the list without needing to log in. It was just stopping the oh, link did I put in stopped at it only put part of it. It only highlighted part of it. But if you thank you, gotcha. out, thank you, helps. thanks. That way I can yeah. If I'm sending it to someone, I could clarify that with for them too. Thank yeah, you. yeah. It's, 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 thank it should, you. It should display like this how it is on the screen um, right here for them without have them having to sign in or anything. However, if anything ever is not working on the site, we also love that kind of feedback. <laughs> so we do have places on the site where you can um, provide feedback. We've just got like a, a generic feedback form here and then um, a contact page, which just goes to, we've got an info at medicalhomeportal.org, which comes directly to me. So you can either use my direct email or this one, either one will get to me. Um, so that is the site in a nutshell. I'd love to hear any more thoughts you have about how you think you could potentially use the tool or questions about lists in, in, um, with our time remaining. Let's see, um, hi, uh, I, I have a question, I guess, kind of, because I think this is really fantastic um, though, because I'm, I'm, call, I'm down in Moab, um, so mm -hmm. we're kind of, rural away from a lot of different services and so yeah. I would wonder like do you think it's like the information for me to be able to like oh can these work with clients not in your area or like if I have you know what sort of, yeah. of availability is that right you know like because yeah. a lot of our things we just have such limited services here and people do have right. to travel quite a bit often What's an example of a type of service that you refer people to pretty frequently? Um, like relating to children, I guess. Um, and I was thinking of a, a couple of kids that we've had that have had like maybe like, you know, gastrointestinal type um, that, yeah, that would maybe just went off hand. I'm hoping this search exists. Sometimes my examples work, sometimes they don't. So one thing we've tried to do on the site, okay, that's. That's not a great example, sorry. <laughs> so one one thing you'll notice here is how on the map we've oh. tried to color code things that are local service versus a statewide service. So let me go ahead and find let me find an example. Oh, nice. Okay. Uh -huh. Where you would see that. Um I'll just do this disability rights group one. Right. That's so, fantastic. Actually, that's another thing I probably would do. Yeah. <laughs> so here's like here's an example of things, even though you're in Moab, there's a few blue markers. Those are going to be statewide services. So you could look on those and just see like. Okay, mm -hmm. this, state, this is considered a statewide provider, meaning they either provide kind of arching, uh, sorry, overarching, urgent, <laughs> overarching resources for the state and or have usually some kind of statewide reach with their programming via like a web tool or something like that. Um, 
Uh, so many more of our providers are providing telehealth services these days too. We try to include that on their listing as well as if they if they provide telehealth services uh, to reach some of those rural areas as well. So that's one way to do it. Um, and we do have, there's specific like search terms for telehealth. Um, that's a really great example. So we have both tele mental health and then tele remote medicine options. So that's a great way to hopefully help find some additional resources mm -hmm. in some of those rural areas also. Super, thank you. Yeah, great question. And there was, I see there's a comment. Somebody said they love the list idea to have all the sticky notes, places coworkers know about exactly. This is like a great opportunity to kind of um, use this tool as a, and you can crowdsource it too. If you have, if you as a, as a, as a group in your office, you can maintain lists that, you know, the entire office is used. And then, you know, everybody's using like the same copy or the same um, set of resources when they're, they're giving these out. Any other questions? Well, Athena, I thank you for sharing with us. I love utilizing the medical home portal with the families that I work with and have shared it several times with it. Um, if nobody has any other questions, I'm gonna just thank Athena for sharing with us and turn the time over to Cindy, who will be talking to us about the BiTAP. All right, so Cindy, if you want to come on and share and. Okay. Well, I'll just introduce myself before I share the screen. So I'm a mental health therapist of over 27 years, and most of my career has actually been down in Southern Utah. I got my master's at the University of Utah, and then I've been in Southern Utah the rest of the time. And uh, I do a lot of trauma work. So working with a lot of highly traumatized people. And I've spent time when I worked for community mental health, um, working with ladies with addiction in the jails and definitely in smaller communities, you do quite a lot and you collaborate with foster care and lots of different, different agencies. And so one of the things that we found um, as a result of being a trauma therapist is if people came in upset or dysregulated, you would all know with whoever you work with that you really can't make much progress. And so you've got to help calm their nervous system down first. And so this resource is just called BiTAP and I'll share my screen and I'll, um, I will not be tech savvy enough to do this and look at the chat. So if someone can do that part for me, that would be great. If Kurt like questions come in. Us. Okay, good. Yes. Oh, okay. Let me get here. Hopefully. Mm. Okay, you guys can see that. Okay. Yes, it's we can. Working yes. okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So, so the research shows. I'll just say this from the start. The research shows that people cannot access any of the learning that you've taught them until their nervous system is regulated. And so, this resource is actually being used really widespread with first responders um, in preschools, in schools, um, dentists, people with disabilities, because every all of us actually, the way the world is, struggles with dysregulation. And so this is just a super simple resource. And this is what they look like. They're just tappers. And what they do is you pair these tappers to this app, it's a BiTAP app, and it just stands for bilateral tapping. And then the tappers, you can hold them or you can wear them all ages. And what it does is the tapping back and forth begins to calm down that limbic system. Um, some of you may have heard of like Dan Siegel's hand puppet. And so it just means that when your brain's calm, then your thinking brain is in the driver's seat. But then if you get triggered or you're overwhelmed, even all of us as stressful jobs, if we get too overwhelmed, then that 
that a different part of the brain gets in the driver's seat. So we really want to keep this as calm as we can so that our thinking brain's in the driver's seat. And that's really hard to do with people who struggle with addiction and they get triggered or their kids who maybe struggle with a variety of issues uh, because of just because of the homes they're in. Um, and so I just want to just go over the science behind why it works and then show you the website um, because it's actually being used by all ages with really great results. And so, and then if you guys have questions at any point, just know you're just feel free to ask them. So I have got to change this right here. Here we go. All right. So, so the science, we're just going to start with back in the 1990s, before the 1990s, a lot of the guesses of why things happen, they, they just had to guess. But once they had the ability to really study the brain and see what is actually happening under different conditions, they actually know what's happening, why it's happening, what part of the brain's activated. And when this part's activated, this part shuts down like, like they know. And so it's actually been a really just a ton of progress in the last couple of decades with us understanding how to help people. And I would liken for myself as a mental health therapist of so many years, I would liken the knowledge that we have now to like how the medical field continues to advance. So if like you had a doctor that was still say doing appendectomies um, the old way, you know, just cutting you wide open. I understand they need to sometimes, but now you can do it laparoscopically. And so the, the stuff we know now about how to help the brain calm down simply and effectively, it's because of the, it's because of fMRIs and the studies that we can actually do. Um, so one thing that we know for all of us is that, so you have two hemispheres and they know that the middle part, it's called the corpus callosum. And you could just a simple way to say it would just be a telephone. And it's just, it's communicating. It's having the two hemispheres communicate all the time. So if I were to take like a student learning how to read, they actually have to have both sides working and different parts of the brain working, which is good for us to know because under ideal conditions, or just think of driving, you're just driving along. And so in with our brain, things are just moving and we're just taking in information and we're calm. And that's how we function at our very, very best. But what, I just got to move this over, keep moving the people over. So we also know, and you've probably heard about the, the thinking brain. And so the prefrontal cortex is what that's called. And you can just go through that. Um, if everybody that we worked with could stay in a calm state, they could actually operationalize everything we teach them. Um, if anyone is in law enforcement that's on, you will know, you, you can hop on, you'll know that a lot of people they're talking to are highly um, stressed. And so they really can't even follow directions very well. Um, they're going to be more oppositional and just, it's just very difficult. And that's just because their prefrontal is not working. And the reason I have, as you look through all of this, the reason I have voluntary muscle movements highlighted is if someone's mildly upset or moderately upset, and you said, will you take a walk with me? That, that bilateral movement would actually calm that amygdala down and they would start to do better. But if they're in a high level of distress, they won't even go for a walk with you. So it's just important to know that if you can get someone to follow directions or will you wiggle your toes or will you take a deep breath, it just means that that prefrontal is not completely offline um, because if it's offline, it's a whole different ball game that we're gonna talk about. Um, the amygdala, so again, this is Dan Siegel. The amygdala is a, is is the part that's actually scanning all the time to try to make sure you're safe. And so as you look at that, um, even if it's a noise, but it's a noise you're familiar with, you really won't startle, but you will if it's something you're not familiar with. So um, just read in the middle of that, as soon as the amygdala is triggered by unfamiliar or perhaps threatening stimulations, it raises the brain's level of anxiety and it'll focus the mind's attention on the immediate situation. So when that happens, every the reason we all need to remember that is when the amygdala is activated, all the stored learning, it just goes out the window. And I could bring in um, several examples of college students who are incredibly smart, but have test anxiety. And because their test anxiety is so high, they actually forget what they've studied. And um, we have a lot of people that aren't able to progress in their field 
whether they're in college or not. I've worked with firefighters who their anxiety is so high. If they didn't have to take a test and they could just show what they, they knew, they would actually be able to move on in certifications. And so this is a big deal for um, students, what we're talking about, but it's a really big deal for professionals too. Um, so, so if you guys have questions at any point, just let me know. Um, and then this is a term that we've actually known about since 1995. So that's quite a long time. And so if someone, it's called an amygdala hijack, it just means if someone is in such a high level of distress, that prefrontal is like completely disabled. So just think about if you're driving in a car and just something comes out at you and you slam on the brakes, that would be the same as an amygdala hijack. And so um, this can happen because of trauma. It can happen. Um, I work with so many traumatized people and we can do a lot of good work and then something can trigger them and uh, they are they are not doing so well. And that's that's because this can just take over. So that's why we have to have a resource besides just coping skills to calm people down. Um, even if they're in therapy, they've got to have something that's going to calm them down because if they don't, they're going to turn to maladaptive mechanisms like a relapse. Um, I worked with people after the um, shooting in Las Vegas, the Route 91 in 2017. And I just want you to know that I mean, there were people that that weren't even drinkers that were becoming drinkers because you just cannot live in this heightened state. And so that's one of the reasons that I wanted to be on this presentation is just to teach about this and just teach how simple it is to calm the nervous system down. So just to recap, um, if any of us just have mild stress, so it just means just mild stress, but then our thinking brain can discern things are okay, then everything settles back down. Um, I think chronic stress, I think most of us could raise our hands with our workloads. Um, and, and I think if you're exposed to chronic stress, it doesn't have to always be high, but chronic, I think you're at great risk for um, burnout and other health problems. And then obviously the high intense trigger is when you really cannot take thoughtful action. So I just want you to think about the clients you work with or the population. And this would be true even with little kids. And any of you that have little kids, you know, if they're completely dysregulated, um, there will be no reasoning. <laughs> but that's also true with adults. So we have to just remember that. Um, so just to answer, just why won't the clients use the coping skills they're taught? And I just want to remind you that they absolutely can't. And so neuro... Um, anatomically, they've actually studied it. And so they can prove that, that everything shuts down under a, under a hijack. So this is a, this is just a model that I use and you can use uh, maybe zones of regulation. You can use whatever it, whatever feels comfortable to you, but this is something that is important for you to know for yourself, but also when you're interacting with your colleagues and also if you're interacting with parents or kids or teachers, or um, we teach teachers this too, just everybody just needs to have some framework to understand that when I'm calm, then my that's green, the window of tolerance green. It just means everything's working just fine, okay? And when I start to go into red, that's just called, we call it the red zone, we could call it hyper arousal. It, it could be examples of someone that gets mad um, someone that's scared, um, if someone's flooding with fear, if uh, just they're anxious or stressed, then that just is what red looks like. And so I would say there's a continuum and high red would be like a panic attack. And so um, just remember, if you're in a high panic situation, you can't remember anything you were taught to do. And so and then blue just means so if you're thinking trauma, red would be fight flight and then blue would be freeze. And so it's really important that everyone knows that you don't ever go from green to blue. You always go green, red, blue, even if it's just quick. And so with our uh, the different populations we work with, if you work with people that are prone to checking out or dissociating um, or avoiding, that's a mechanism to survive. But if we can catch it right before they drop down, that would be great. Um, for the rest of us, what blue looks like um, just think about after you've had a really hard day at work um, or a hard week and then you come home and somehow you're supposed to have enough 
uh, gas in the tank to be connected with your family and to want to do things. And most of us under those circumstances, you know, if we open it up, would probably just say, you know, I just kind of want to binge on Netflix or it's, that's when I turn to my comfort foods. Um, so when we have all of the uh, strategies that say, you know, eat healthy, exercise, get good sleep. I think it's really great. And the only people that can really do that are the people in green. And so what we want to do is we want to spend the least amount of time in red and the least amount of time in blue. And so if we know that um, talking isn't the best method initially, then we had to come up with this with a different strategy to help people. So that's what I want to talk to you about. So research was actually done um, officially in 2018 um, to say that when the amygdala is activated, what calms it down the fastest um, outside of alcohol or um, heavy meds and what they found was it's bilateral stimulation. And the reason for that is just remember, so if the two hemispheres, if when they're calm, they're working together, then when they're upset, if we get them starting to work again, the sensing brain notices that, and then it actually helps this part just calm down. And so then you're back to your brain functioning how it's supposed to. So just imagine, just think of the bilateral tapping as just something that's going to support people if they're stressed out. Um, if you had to give a presentation, so I'll say mildly stressed out, um, that I'm going to use the tappers just to keep my nervous system calm. And if it's higher and stuff, then it's just going to help restore the brain functioning, how it's, how it does when it's calm. Um, and so this was the study and I'll have a uh, references at the end that you can look at, but what they found out is the reason that we want to do behavioral interventions over medication is it's not that medication's not okay, but there's a lot of study on acute stress. And what they find is that, um, the pharmaceutical interventions just, they just don't work as well as we hope they would. And so then they try to say, then what can help when someone's stressed and they say, teach coping skills, but now we know they can't access that part of their brain. So if we can calm the brain down first, then, then they can access that higher thinking. So what we love about the tappers, I'll just read this bottom part, a key advantage of amygdala deactivation through behavioral manipulations rather than pharmacological treatments is that they're non-invasive, precise in time and duration, and shown to be clinically effective. So if you started to go into red or your clients or a preschool student or even a teacher or a first responder, they could literally could just turn the tappers on and the tapping is immediate and it just calms them down. And then you're back in green and then in green, you're your best self. And then you can access all of that uh, prior learning. So I'll give an example of like a first responder. Um, maybe he or she goes out on a call, they come back, they know they're supposed to do a report. Um, they need to do that report, but they get called out again and they have all those stress hormones dumping. Now they come back to the office. Now they have two reports. And uh, so it just goes on and on. And so if we could just get even if you guys, when you're writing reports or your paperwork to use the tappers, if you're tired, it'll actually just help your brain focus up a lot more because um, we all know that the more we get behind, the more we stay behind. Um, so this is what we teach people. Um, this is taught in, so what we're trying to do is just calm the nervous system down first and then all the other programs, there's probably so many programs on how to calm people down. Um, we just say, calm down, do this simple stuff first. And then if you need the other things, then you're better able to access it. So in a minute, I'm just going to show you a video of someone that used the tappers, but, but if you don't have the tappers, then I would just say to you, if you could go for a walk, I would, but there's a lot of situations that you can't leave. Um, and so you have to stay in that situation. And then I would just actually just wiggle your toes back and forth. Um, I work with a lot of college students who are struggling with test anxiety. And um, if their school doesn't have tappers, if they do, great. But if they don't, then I just tell them just move their feet back and forth or they can put their hands on their thighs and just for a minute, just start tapping. But see, they have to have enough of that prefrontal to follow directions. If they don't, and it's a different situation, then they've just got to 
have someone either tap or say, we're going to go for a walk. Cause there's a lot of the, um, if you're really upset, you can't even do this stuff. And so then we're just hoping then they can just hit a button, get the back and forth tapping, calm down, and then they can do the rest of the stuff. But this is just what we teach. So tapping first and then movement. So again, I'll just go back to test anxiety. So if I'm working with someone that is struggling, they maybe can't get up and walk around the room, but they could stretch. So see, they could do a few things and the movement actually lets your brain know that you're safe. The tapping does too. And then if you can move, your brain is actually going to start to register safety. And then if you'll drink water or chew gum, then actually by swallowing, it's another cue to your body that you're safe. Um, because if you had a dog chasing you or something, you're not swallowing and you're not, you know, you're not casually stretching, you're freaking out. So, um, so you're just helping your brain to start to register safety. And then we would say breathing and then connection. So um, if anyone's like, why this order? I just want you to know as a trauma therapist, I played with this order. So I'm working with people who have been just traumatized and seeing them immediately after. So they're in that really heightened state. And even if I see them three times a week, they have all those hours in between where they're dysregulated. So those are even the people I see that need regulation. And then all the people that actually don't access therapy, which is far more than do, um, they just need to have a regulation resource. So if, so if they were in my office completely upset because of what just happened, and I said, let's take a deep breath together, people that are really high red can't. But if I say, I want you just to hold these and I hand them the tappers, I literally can see them start to calm down after like a minute. And then they can follow direction. And so if you're the person co-regulating, then you could say, um, let's move and let's stretch and let's take a drink of water together. And then the connection piece is we are actually connecting together. And on that um, slide where I showing the research, I just want you to know um, as a trauma therapist, so the therapy that I've been trained in um, to do individual trauma work and then community level trauma work is it's called EMDR. And one of the components of that therapy is bilateral stimulation. So you're either doing eye movement or you're having tapping, or you can have auditory tones. And so what they've found is what that mechanism is doing all by itself is that's what's calming the amygdala down. So someone can reprocess trauma. And so then we have taken that and as a standalone resource and what we're finding is um, people are sleeping better, they're regulating better, their reading scores are going up. So we're finding that there's the use is actually widespread because it's just supporting the brain with how it works under normal conditions. Um, so I'm gonna show you this video just because with um, a lot of the focus of this project is working with parents who struggle with addiction and then um, also working with their children. And so this is Megan and she is just going to share how she used the tappers. So it's about three minutes long. So okay, and then I'll turn it up to make sure. Um, I've been in recovery from alcohol and drugs since August 23rd, 2007. It was really hard. I, the detox period was hard. Um, I wasn't able to sleep very well. I had nightmares. I'm so grateful for the life that I get to live today and to be sober and to be a sober mother. I have had a continuous struggle with anxiety and depression and also with my babies, um, prenatal and postpartum depression and, um, that I've been able to manage. Um, and use one of the great tools that I get to talk about today uh, is by tap. I am honored to have this opportunity to talk about it and, and to share my story on how it's helped me. In early sobriety, um, even in rehab or the new talks period, how I managed my anxiety, um, <laughs> there were many days I just had to suffer through it. Now that I'm using by tap, um, Oh, I wish I would have had them in early recovery and, and how I think that they would have helped me. And for those that are in rehab right now, and they can have this tool to help them fall asleep without having to worry about taking something that could jeopardize their sobriety. It would have helped me socially because when you first get sober, 
you don't have the substances to lean on. And I, I used a lot of time to help me in social crowds to feel comfortable with myself. And I think by tap would be a great tool for them to use just to help regulate you, to help to calm you, to help you to be able to socialize, be able to speak in public, to share in recovery meetings, which is all so scary because it's all new when you're in early recovery. It's been life saving for me. And I'm a mother of little children and my days can be long and overwhelming and stressful and um, use by tap. Sometimes I wear them all day and it just helps me stay within my window of tolerance. What I love about using them to go to sleep is that I don't have to take any medication or anything that could jeopardize my sobriety. I'm um, just with all the unknowns and, and dealing with the anxiety and depression on top of all that. I don't know what I would have done without by tap. I'd love to share a story. When I went in there right before they took me to do the C-section, I asked the anesthesiologist, I said, hey, I need to know what you're putting in my IV. You know, I'm a recovering alcoholic addict. I need help. You know, I'm just worried. And uh, he told me that it was necessary that I had to take something, that I'd be okay. And he came over and grabbed my hand and he says, I've been in recovery for almost 20 years. You're going to be okay. I'll be right here with you. And uh, so I got through the C-section and I used the tappers clear through that. And the nurses and doctors were amazed at how little of narcotics I had to take and how quickly I got off of them. And I am forever grateful for my tap that I was able to get through that scary time. I know the tappers are helping me and have helped me. Um, I've seen an overall reduction in my anxiety. Um, when I do get overwhelmed or triggered or um, upset, I the intervals last like not as long. I'm able to get out of it quicker and back in my window of tolerance quicker. There's one thing that I can tell somebody that that doesn't have this tool yet or is in need of something to help manage their anxiety or overwhelm. I would, I would just try it. <laughs> Okay, now the tricky thing will be, can I get back? Okay, good. All right. And then I'm just going to share um, a few examples from parents and, uh, and teachers, and then just love to answer your questions because I haven't uh, probably gone over it as much as I need to, but um, in terms of just the actual function of them. But uh, this is a mom whose daughter is um, struggles on the autism spectrum. And so what she does and what a lot of people are doing is um, they're front loading their, their children before they're upset so that they know already what they are and uh, then they have them use them. So if they were already with this daughter then and say they're already in her pockets or her socks, then the mom could just hit start on her phone and the tapping starts and they're raging and the staying upset has gone from 10 to 20 minutes to at most with three minutes. And so the reason why, again, is your brain, when it's doing the left-right communication, this part cannot stay in the driver's seat. And so you have two different systems. And so it's actually calming that system down. And then she's one, and we have lots and lots of students using them actually, um, where she has them in class. So she wears them during class in situations that they know are going to be a problem. And there have been instances where the teacher was able to get to her in time to have her activate them and no problems occurred. And in some of the severe SPED classes that with the kids that they know are going to dysregulate, it's not really a matter of if, it's when. They, like I said, they already have the tappers on the kids. And then when they can tell that they're starting to go up into red, they actually can just hit start. And then the tapping starts immediately. And then it just calms them down. So they're not having the meltdowns that they used to have. So super simple intervention that's yielding really great results across all age groups and in all situations. Um, and then a lot of you probably heard, unfortunately, about um, what happened earlier this year in Enoch, Utah. And for those of you who didn't, um, uh, just a, a man, I've had to do a lot of work on this uh, as a therapist, so it's tender, but um, didn't know I'd cry, sorry. Uh, but a man killed his whole family and then his mother-in-law and himself. So we have a, a community that um, came back from Christmas break last year. 
So we had preschool affected, um, elementary school affected, uh, middle school and high school, and uh, the entire community was just rocked. And so what we did um, in that situation is we, so again, I'm a therapist, so I go in, do the trauma protocols, which, which is what you do, but but people were really in high dysregulation. So first responders were, um, their families were, the neighbors um, obviously were, and you have little kids that became, you know, terrified overnight um, of their own dads. And so we just had a really difficult situation on our hands. And uh, the lady that presented before me, and then someone was from Moab got on. It's it's just true in rural areas, there's not enough help. And in a situation like this, um, even though I understand teletherapy and I've done it, uh, you really with high trauma want to be there in person. And if it can be people that uh, as a therapist that the community knows that's better than having a lot of outside people come for a week and then leave. And so, um, so lots and lots of services were provided by local therapists. And then on top of it, a lot of funding was raised to hand out tappers. And so this is um, just one of the quotes of one of the little ones that was struggling so much. And we were able through just donations that came in um, from businesses and nonprofits to hand out like over a hundred kits to the people that needed it most. And then what it did is it allowed them to, like this quote says, just allowed them to feel calmer. And so then they could actually resume some of their normal um, functioning as obviously they've had a pretty rough year. And uh, and then of course the anniversary is coming up next month. So we're gonna have another wave of difficult, but this is just uh, an example of how the tappers were used in classroom. And then um, this is for you. I would just remind you um, and the handouts are on the website too of the window of tolerance and how to calm down. But I would just remind you, and it's a reminder for me too, that what we don't want to do is just us as providers is just deal with stress after stress after stress after stress, but not ever really get back to our window. And that's why that's why at the end of the day, we're our window's pretty small, or maybe last night, maybe some of your kids were sick. And so you're tired and you get enough sleep and then you got to come to work. So your window's compromised, um, you know, for many reasons. And then you've got to do all the work you've got to do. And so I would just encourage you to just be mindful of your own levels. And if you can tell you're a little bit in red, you could just, whether you go for a walk or you stretch, you take a deep breath. I would just do some of those pretty simple interventions just to help your nervous system, you know, get back to baseline. Um, because we really are, they've done research. We're the only species that sits in our stress. And so um, wild animals, they'll fly and they'll hop and they'll run, but, but we sit. And so just, just be mindful that those things that I'm teaching will, will help you too. Um, and so then this is a little bit more about the app. So that's what the tappers look like. Um, I actually have some in my pocket. I'll just show you. I'll quit share screening in a second. But they're just, you can just hold them, you know, or you can wear them and they just tap back and forth. But they paired to an app and it was really important to us that we just didn't have settings that were preset because everybody's different. And I remember um, dealing with a tragedy in Ivins, Utah, another rural community. Um, we went to the fire station to work with the first responders afterwards. And one of the gentlemen, um, turn the tappers all the way to highest speed, highest intensity, which for most of us would be completely annoying. Um, and he fell asleep holding them. And I think it's just because he is so stressed out, but it matched more how he felt just they're really fast, but, um, but you can adjust the settings. And so like I use them to sleep at night. And then obviously I do that on the lighter end. Um, we designed them so that they felt more like tapping. So like if you were tapping your feet back and forth, it's just, it's a more natural, you know, if you just tap, so they feel like a tap. Um, and then we wanted to make sure that they have a good battery life. Uh, we knew that people that have flight anxiety would be using them. And um, maybe all of you know this, I didn't know this until recently, but pilots actually can't be on any uh, like psychotropic medications uh, or they can't fly. Um, and so we have a lot of uh, airline pilots who deal with anxiety and just kind of have to white knuckle it. And then they also, while they're flying, say they're doing an international flight, they actually can't really talk about their stress. 
uh, because the black box is recording everything. So they are really having to hold a lot in and we're having a lot of mental health um, stress and issues with uh, the airline industry. And so this is a resource that they're starting to look at because it's so simple to help them stay calmer. And so then the battery life is over 60 hours per charge. And then what's really nice is I had mine on during this and you guys couldn't hear them. So you could actually have them on while you're presenting or in court or whatever. And, and it's actually not everyone's going to hear it, which is important, or that would give you more anxiety. Um, and then I'm just going to just really quick and then spend time if there's any questions, but just, I just want you to know on the website, if you go clear to the bottom, and if you ever want to see more videos, there's, they're just embedded in the website. But um, if you go down to the bottom, you can click on handouts, and that's where you could find the handouts that you can actually get was part of this presentation. And then these two handouts, because we work with a lot of schools, uh, preschool all the way to university level, and just teaching them the language that they could use with um, their students. And then the other one place I'd have you go is just to news. Let's go there really quick, then I'll stop sharing. Um, and as you scroll through news, you'll just be able to see all the different um, agencies and departments that are using the tappers. Um, so we won't go through all of them, I'll go through the ones that are just on the top. So these are actually being used um, in domestic violence programs. They're using them when they go out on calls and they're using them to hand to the victims uh, when they're in high distress so that they can tell the fuller story, which is really important. Um, as a trauma therapist, I've worked with so many people whose cases never go forward because they say their testimony wasn't strong enough. And what you're asking them to do is recall events in a heightened state, which you now know is really hard to do. So if we can get them calmer, they can tell the fuller story. Um, they're allowing the individuals who've been victimized to actually use those, the tappers during exams, and they're actually allowing them to use them in court, um, even to testify. And that's a big deal. And so we're getting better testimony. Um, with the children, the children's justice centers, they have them, um, but they're not allowing them yet to use them while they interview. They can use them before they interview and then not during the interview. And the reason is just because the, they think the defense attorneys will say, you know, because they had tapping, that meant they were supposed to say yes, like you're somehow giving them a message. And so, um, okay, so we have a lot more education to do, but but what we are able to do is have the kids able to use them before and then after, and that's turned out to be a big deal. Um, then I can just end on these last two. So some of you may have heard of the SAMI Center. Um, it's up in the Salt Lake area, but a lot of kids in preschool who really struggle for a variety of reasons, um, they are actually not able to go to regular preschool because they're just, they just are too disruptive. And so that's the Sammy Center takes the kids that are really hard and we work with them and they have tappers. And I just want you to know that even little kids, um, when they feel calmer and they have a resource that they know works, they actually know to ask for them. And that's, to me, mindfulness at its best. And so we're spending a lot of time and effort on a lot of programs. And I think if we could just simplify things and just help basically calm the nervous system down um, in a simple way, I think that's that would be less overwhelming than all the programs that we're trying to teach. Um, and then just, just know that first responders are starting to look at them quite a lot. And um, we're gonna most likely be out in Maui helping the the first responders there who've lost their homes. So they lose their homes and then they're still, because uh, of the fire, then they're still helping their community. So they're amazing heroes, uh, but they're really struggling. And so a lot of you probably know first responders are fairly treatment resistant, um, but they desperately need help. And so this is just a simple way that they can use the tappers while they um, sometimes are on calls, but definitely while they're writing reports and also to help them sleep. And so it's helping them a lot. So I will um, stop sharing and then just see if you guys have any questions at all that you might want to ask. So Cindy, thanks for the presentation. That's a great resource. We did have two comments. One was asking if we could use some of these slides or a particular slide 
um, if you'd be willing to share those. I think those are usually put into Canvas. So if you'll just share those with Janelle and then we'll put those in the Canvas um, learning management system. And then just yeah. now, Emily, Emily asked, she says, I might've missed this, but have the tappers been used with kids under preschool age? Yes. And if you didn't have tappers and you had a, even a baby that was upset or dysregulated, you literally could just tap back and forth and they will calm down. And so the science behind it is just it calms the amygdala down, but you would know what the really little ones. I mean, obviously you're rocking and doing all of that. And then if they still stayed fussy, I don't know, maybe someone could just tap, come up behind them and just tap back and forth on their little shoulders or their um, ankles and it will help them calm down too. And um, I want you to know we were presenting at the Washington County School District and they had the self-contained classroom um, just nearby. And uh, one of the kids got out and uh, definitely in a man body. And uh, he was really mad that someone had shredded a piece of paper that he wanted. So he was banging his head aggressively on the cinder block wall right there. And so I just showed him really quick, just behind him to say, I'm going to start tapping on your shoulders. And they just start tapping back and forth. And your sensing brain doesn't have a choice, but to pay attention to like that, what is happening. And it was over within like a minute and then he's crying and then things are back to normal. And so what, what's really cool is you just don't have to stay in a heightened state for long periods of time. You can actually recover quite quickly. And so it's a resource that's uh, being used obviously with kids that really struggle, but it's also being used with the high end kids that have, like I said, test anxiety that, that are fine, but they just struggle that way. So it's just something that can actually help everybody. Cause it's just, how our everyone's brain works and we're just helping it work at its best in a super simple way. And then Cindy also, there's just a question of, can anyone get tappers? Yes, you can. And uh, so it's not just a therapy tool and they know, um, I mean, it would be no different than if you had like a bongo drum and you told someone to tap back and forth or they're snapping back and forth or they're walking. So anything bilateral, is actually what's going to help your brain settle down the quickest. So anyone can use them. Then are they covered by insurance at all? Not, not yet, but they did get approved for like, if someone has like a health savings account or a flex spending account um, to get them approved by insurance takes several years. Um, but but we are in that process and um, yeah, it's, it, but I'm just shaking my head. I wish they were, but I do want you to know, like um, with different um, agencies, like we didn't go to the next one on the news section, but like the division of the juvenile justice system in Utah, um, they use their zero suicide grant to be able to get all their therapists across the state tappers. And um they're using them obviously with their clients, but they're using them for themselves too, because they have high turnover and high burnout. So it's just helping them. Uh, it helps them, but it helps their clients too. So there's lots of different funding avenues that agencies are using to be able to get the tappers. There is a comment in here that they just have, um, they, they were in your breakout session last month and they've okay. been looking forward to this um, and all your ideas. They've been so helpful and um, in so, for so many situations. And then another question about how much do they cost? They cost, they cost $307. And then um, we just always give I know there's a Christmas thing for 30 off, but we always give um, schools discounts too. Um, you know, and if I liken that to therapy, I, I can give someone. So, so just know, I still believe in therapy. So I'm still a therapist, but I just want you to know the, to see me three times, someone could use those tappers three times in a day and it equals the cost of three sessions. And so, um, people can actually use those hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of times. And we have a lot of schools that buy them and then they allow the kids to check them out like library books when they need them. And uh, what we're finding with the wellness rooms is I, I think it's a good idea, but as kids get into middle school and high school, what we're finding more is kids um, 
just because of the stigma associated with going to the wellness room. Um, a lot of the kids aren't using that um, as a resource because they don't want to be labeled. And so we're trying to find workarounds for the kids that actually need the help, but won't access the help. And so we're finding like, maybe they're able to just go to their school counselor and just check out tappers rather than go to the wellness room. And so we're just working with all the schools and all their different situations. And uh, we had one school track uh, rate their anxiety, like when they checked it out, they would rate it. And then when they brought the tappers back, they'd rate it again. And that school, it was Canyon View High School in Cedar. It was like a, I don't have a, it's either 52 or 53% reduction collectively. And then test scores went up in their math class that used them up 13%. And that's just from one intervention. And just, that's amazing. So really it's just helping the brain stay calm and focused is what it's doing. And there's a few more in the chat here. Um, okay. Cindy, first, how is it for children with autism or children with um, sensory sensitivities? Um, that one, that one lady, her daughter was on the spectrum. Uh, what I would say with kids on the spectrum is they, like, we had a kid, <laughs> as soon as he felt him, he's like, put him right on his face. Like this feels like a heartbeat and he just loved him. Other kids might, um, I don't know, maybe this plastic might bug them or something. And so then they might have to put them like say in their sock and then roll it down one. So they might like the texture of their sock, but not the tapper casing. So there's workarounds. Um, but we've had great success with um, individuals on the spectrum and their parents are grateful. I mean, when you, you know, sometimes kids really not just on the spectrum, but struggle with transition. And this just helps decrease that time because they just can't stay in red they won't be as oppositional in green. They just won't be as in red. And if they are, they'll, they can uh, just express themselves in healthier ways than how all of us do when we're in high red. Um, so it's just, I think it just depends on the individual, but if they didn't like the touch of the casing, then we just have to find something to put the tapper in um, a fabric or something that they do like. And then the other thing we are working with is, I don't know if you guys saw on the news um, earlier in the year, that little four-year-old boy from Salina, he got Utah, he got kicked in the head by a horse. And um, so all of his occupational therapy at Primary Children's was actually bilateral. All the exercises were trying to get the left and right brain communicating again. So it's just the same principle. And uh, when he came home, he's home now, um, his grandma got him tappers because he would just get really overwhelmed with certain tasks that he didn't before. And so he just wears them and we've got the cutest picture of him. And so it can work in just about any situation. And so if someone got the tappers and they're just like, for whatever reason to say they don't like them, it's, it's okay. Like if someone said the only way I can do physical fitness is swimming, then I don't really want to do that, but I would hike or something. Um, so then, but then I would just say, but then just still use the principle of if you're upset, you've got to do something to get the bilateral going again to calm down. So even if you didn't have tappers, you, you still can wiggle your toes or um, go for a walk or not everyone's going to hit a bongo drum, but all of that actually helps your brain a lot. So mm -hmm. Two more. One, can you leave it on all day and night? Do you recommend using, or do you recommend using it at certain times? And then the other one has to do with wearing an eye patch if having anxiety, if there's research on that. Let me do the first one. I had to write it down. Once you hit menopause, you got it. <laughs> Okay, so the first one was, um, how can often can on? you wear it? Yeah, okay. can you leave it on all day and night? And do you recommend certain times? I, you know, I personally don't need to do that. I use them myself just if I'm preparing for a presentation or presenting, um, or if I actually use them for writing, because I have to do a lot of writing uh, with the research and stuff. And so I, it actually helps me focus better. And if I come to work and there's like, I don't know, 10 big projects do, then I'll wear them. Because if I don't get out of hyper arousal, being overwhelmed, I'll actually drop into blue. My blue looks like procrastination. Um, and so I don't want to do that. So I want to stay in that window. So, so I think you just kind of learn how you need them. Um, I personally don't think I need them every night to sleep, um, cause I can turn the settings right down on the low end, but as a trauma therapist, if my last session is, uh, dicey, it's hard to sleep sometimes, especially after this many years of being a therapist. So I, I do use them to sleep and I'm back to sleeping seven, eight hours a night. So I'm like, why would I not use them? But I've had a gentleman that's on disability for OCD. He, it's severe. We should have done a before and after picture. 
and he was the first one, even in our pilot study group, clear back in 2016, he wore them like all the time. And I was like, mm, do you need to do that? And he just said, yeah, he says, I still have OCD, but it doesn't feel like it's right here. It feels like it's taken a step back and I can function better. So he still stayed on his meds, but he just did better. So the people that seem to wear them a lot are people right after high-end trauma. Um, they wear them a lot. Uh, and that makes sense to me because uh, they can't concentrate. They can't sleep. They're overwhelmed. It's it's they're in shock. Um, like if I were on the campus at UNLV right now, we would probably be handing those out um, to everyone that's really stuck in that high level. Um, but I think as you start to use them and you feel better, I think you can just tell when you need them and when you don't. That's what we found anyway. And then what was the second question? Something about an eye patch? Yeah, second question, just ask if you had thoughts on wearing an eye patch, if they have anxiety, I, and if there's any research on that. You know, I, I can look that research up, but I haven't done any research on that specifically. I mean, I'm open to that, um, but I don't, I don't, I definitely know I can't speak to that yet. I'd have to read up on it. So whoever wrote that, question. I'm just going to ask really quick, whoever asked that, just what, what's the, what's the thought or the theory behind that. I'm just curious. Unless they don't want to be identified. <laughs> That's okay too. <laughs> I have not heard that. So I'd have, I'll look that up for myself that maybe there is something to it. Well, fantastic. Cindy, that was just such a great um, presentation, as well as um, learning more about the medical home portal. We have been dropping the survey in our chat. So if you will please take a minute and complete the survey. I also dro dropped in the chat our registration for 2024. Um, please sign up. We're going to have some great sessions for our 2024 um, substance use and how it impacts the family unit. Um, so I thank you for everybody for your time and your participation in today's session. Um, I will give you two minutes back of your of your day. So thank you, thank you. Enjoy your holidays. How do I